well, this guy has to check all three of these, as does this one, as does this one. I should have put this in the diagram. <laughs> Bloom filters. Here's the question that came in. I consider myself reasonably good at reading an execution plan, and I'm, I'm glad you do. Most of us do as well, which is great. However, a colleague asked me to explain the BF section in an execution plan, and what does BF mean? So to explain that, let's start with an example, and we'll work our way back to Bloom filters, because this is probably the, the, one of the most common places you'll see it. One of the cool things with, with the partitioning option in the Oracle database is this thing called partition pruning. So if I have a table called sales and we don't have to look at the syntax too carefully, all we have to be aware of is that we've got a petition for each month. And I've defined them here. This is not an interval, it's just a straight out. Here I have a static list of partitions, one for each month. The cool thing with partition pruning is that you manage to avoid having to scan great chunks of data. So if I do a query here saying, show me some data for a particular day in July, you can see the execution plan tells me I'm only going to scan the partition for July, the seventh partition. Partition start, partition stop is seven. Partition pruning is pretty good. In this case, I've immediately avoided having to scan 11 months. But it's got some awesome, you know, if it's a bind variable, it still works. It won't tell you what the partition is because it doesn't know until you actually pass a bind variable in the actual value. But it will tell you that, yes, I'll be doing just a single range partition, just one partition, not the whole table. And the key is I'll work out when you're actually trying to execute it. But there's enough there in the plan to tell me that I'm getting what I want. I'm getting partition pruning. Even when you do things like in an in clause, it says, yes, I'll be doing a partition range in list. So whatever those two values are, unfortunately, the partition start and stop isn't good enough to show you what the explicit partition numbers are. It's just a limitation of the execution plan output. But in this case, we'll scan the June partition and the December partition and skip all the others. When it comes to subqueries though and joins, things get a bit more complicated. If I look at this query here, out of the box in a non-partitioned arrangement, I would simply have to scan the entire sales table and the entire employee table, obviously, because employees not partitioned, but sales is. But ideally, we'd like to not have to do that. Wouldn't it be cool if we could scan the employee table and based on the data in it, decide on how we're going to access the sales table? If we look at the execution plan, this is where we start seeing these strange colon BF operators. And we can see what's going on. It says the first thing I'm going to do is scan the employee table. And it says in doing so, I'm going to do a part, part join filter create. That's a little bit of gobbledygook, but what we're saying is we're actually going to create what's called a bloom filter, and then we're going to use that bloom filter in order to prune out partitions in the sales table. When it comes to these, when you start seeing these things, what do these things mean? What does BF mean? This is the definition of Wikipedia. I'll have to read this. The bloom filter is a space efficient probabilistic data structure that is used to test whether an element is a member of a set. And the good thing is when you read that, I'm going, I have no clue what that's talking about. So I thought I'd give you a metaphor and hopefully a, a timely metaphor to help explain how this is going to work. A good metaphor I like is what I call phoning in advance. And what I mean by phoning by that's let me give you an example. There's a movie I want to see. It's coming out or I think it's probably out already in the States, but it's coming out shortly in Australia called A Quiet Place Part Two, the sequel. It's a horror movie with John Krasinski and Emily Blunt. Cool movie about aliens and monsters and sounds and stuff like that. But I'm keen to see it. But obviously, having not been to a cinema for so long, everyone in Perth is like just desperate to go to the movies nowadays because they can finally all sit next to each other. If this movie is coming out, it's going to be incredibly popular. So I'm normally going to phone up. I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to phone up. So look, I want to have, you know, I want to get a nice seat in gold class with the big reclining seats. Do you have any seats? I phone ahead and the guy goes, hello, it's the sequel to A Quiet Place. No one's been at the movie for two years. Are you serious? There is no way on earth you're going to get tickets for that, mate. Try again in six months when we've, you know, the, the volume has dropped a little bit. And that's why you phone ahead, because I didn't want to have to drive down there and actually then be told, no, we're sold out. He might not have said that. The person that owns the cinema might have said, you know, there's a few seats left. 
you know, we're not actually sold. There's a few slates left in the session that you want. Come on down. So I jump in the car and of course I'll just absolutely hoon down there. I, you know, grab myself some popcorn and I go to the ticket desk and I'm ready to go. And I get there and I get rid of my money out and they go, ah, sorry, we're sold out. Frustrating, I know. But that's the risk you pay when there's a few seats left, there's a time it takes to get down there in the car, etc. That is what a bloom filter is. A bloom filter is these two things. It's the phoning in advance. The, the, the bloom filter is like your mobile phone in, in this metaphor. You phone in advance and it might save you a drive. The bloom filter can definitely tell you that you can't get tickets or it might tell you there's a chance, but it's not a guarantee. And so in more mathematically correct terms, what we're saying is when data gets put through a bloom filter, you might get a false positive. If you're trying to see if some data is, I need to act on some data, putting it through a bloom filter, it might say, yes, you need to do some more work with this data. But in reality, you don't. It doesn't apply, for example, to a join condition. However, with a bloom filter, false negatives are impossible. If the bloom filter says, nope, you don't need to do any more work with this data, you can guarantee that that is not the case. And the way a bloom filter works is you have some incoming data and it runs through multiple hash functions and those hash functions basically return bits. And what you're doing is building up a bit mask of segment in memory and then you use that bit mask to do comparisons to other data structures. Now to help explain this, I found this cool website called uh, jasondavies.com slash bloom filter. Unfortunately, the website is, the demo is like it's a GIF and it's a tiny little GIF. So hopefully you can see that, but I'll, I'll read it as we go. Uh, you can see down the middle here is our little bit mask. And what I can do is at the top left here, I can actually type in values that I would like to put through my bloom filter. It's going to put whatever uh, data in there through three functions and each one will return some positions in that bit mask and it'll set them. So let me play the video. And I'll read it out as we go. So I typed in A, and they're the three bits it set for A. Then B, and then C, and then D. And each time you can see that the three hash functions create various spots in the bit mask. So each letter is being applied through three hash functions. That's why you can see three arrows coming out of each of these things. And I go all the way down to J. Let me pause here. I've got an incoming set of data, the letters A through J. Each one's been put through three hash functions. Each of those hash functions returns a position in the bit mask. And so you can see I've sort of colored in sort of a chunk of these bits. Now I'm going to see I've got some data on the other side of my bloom filter. And I want to see if the data I supply here is one of these, A through J, because effectively I'm doing something similar to a join here. But the first one I do, I can't remember what I'm there. QW doesn't, you know, it says it's definitely not there. I type some other stuff. What do I, what do I try next? There's a pause here. I type in R, the three hash functions don't match. S doesn't match, B doesn't match, one doesn't match, two did. If we look at the hash function results for the number two, they hit that yellow one, that yellow one, and that yellow one. So this is one of the examples of a false positive. A bloom filter has correctly said R's not in there, Q's not in there, V's not in there. They're all definitely not in there. But then it said, you know, two might be in there. So you would actually have to grab this value to go over here and actually see if it's there. But you can see the bloom filter has saved me some work. I didn't have to take my value of R over here and go check this list here. There's a whole, in fact, if we keep playing it, you can see there's a whole stack of things here. It's going to go, yep, yeah, probably not there, definitely not there, definitely not there, etc. It continues onwards and all these values that say definitely not there are bits of work that I have saved. I didn't have to go over to that side of the data and look and see if that data is actually present. So already you can sort of get an idea for how joins could be improved because we put the data through a bloom filter and can definitely decide we don't have to go compare it with the other data set because there's no way it can be there. Hopefully that video helps explain things a bit. So how does this apply back to partitioning and why is bloom filters very, very useful for partitioning? First, as I saw in that execution plan, I scan my employee table. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the year from my higher date, which is the join column I was using. I can extract the year from the date and I can put the year into a bloom filter. So as I go through the data, the bloom filter might fill in these particular bit masks. I've been very, very simplistic here. Then I can take not the partition table, but I can take the dictionary definition 
for the dish for the partition table because I know from the partitions what years in this particular case my partitions for a given year I can take each of those and put them through a bloom filter as well and I might fill in a few more dots the ones that line up tells me that these are the only partitions I'll need to scan. By putting the partition definitions through a Bloom filter and equating it to the smaller table's actual data values, I've managed to prune out my partitions. I know that only this one, which is 2015, this one 2019, this one 2020, therefore I only have to scan three sales partitions. So I'm doing partition pruning by using a Bloom filter to sift through the data first. That's why they're very, very cool. The, the general case for a Bloom filter is I have a set of data on this side. I want to see if this data is in this piece of data here, this data set here, but doing that comparison is expensive. And in a database, generally this means it could be an expensive join. This could be a massive data set with no easy way of scanning it through. So anything you can do to try improve the performance of that is where a bloom filter gets used to you. you put a bloom filter on this side and then you come up with some mechanism of hopefully avoiding having to scan this as much it's not just partition pruning we use this we use it in things like parallel query slaves because parallel query slaves as you can imagine you take one table you have lots of worker threads scanning different chunks of the table and then if you're doing a join you have other parallel worker threads scanning the other table now normally if you had say three worker threads here and three worker threads here. Well, this guy has to check all three of these, as does this one, as does this one. I should have put this in a diagram. <laughs> Using Bloom filters, we can eliminate the amount of messages that have to go between those parallel worker threads to try prematurely eliminate data from consideration. Exadata offloading, another great example. In an Exadata system, you have a database node and you have a storage server. And between them, you have InfiniBand or in later versions, um, 100 gigabit ethernet. Doesn't matter how good your network is, it's expensive to go across a network line to do data. So you might be able to make some decisions as to what do I have to get back from the storage cell using a Bloom filter? Or what do I have to pass down to a storage cell using Bloom filters to eliminate the amount of traffic going across? There are so many smarts in Exadata. The other one is in memory. When we're doing in memory joins as well, the scanning of data in memory is so blazingly fast. Anything that's different to just scanning in memory and going back to what I'd call conventional database stuff, joins, etc., is you know orders of magnitude slower because the RAM is so quick. It's really, really expensive to do join comparisons compared to just reading these incredibly fast RAM structures in your memory. Therefore, once again, Bloom filters to try reduce the amount of data to join to make it to get the true benefits of the in-memory subsystem. There's lots of other examples as well, and I wouldn't be surprised as, as time goes on, you'll see more and more Bloom filters in your execution plans, and they're obviously nothing to be scared of.